any sort of introduction into like black history <laughs> at all at school. Um, so yeah, that's my relationship with it. And you, David? Um, I mean, to be black and British is to be in a dilemma and to be a co into a conversation. Um, the question like British history makes you ask, and I am inevitably going to talk about history because I'm an historian, is there has been enormous hostility to the idea that you could be British and anything other than white. And whiteness and Britishness were, for many years, and still in the minds of many people, are seen as the same thing and synonymous. So to me, to be black and British is to be part of a battle about whether or not that term can be, that duality can be made real, whether we can fully embrace our Britishness as well as our blackness. Uh, I'm very much of the view people that we can, we have to, we should, that we should claim not only that title, but also our citizenship, our full citizenship, our place in the history, um, and our, um, our kind of right to be part of the British story. So I think it's a dilemma, but it's also a battle, a campaign, and an ongoing one. Yeah. Okay, so for me, um, black Britishness is the, uh, it's the political and the national category that I guess that I most feel that I belong to. But I also feel that within that there are um, so many other aspects to uh, my identity being half Nigerian. My mother is Nigerian and my father was English. Um, having spent some of my life in Nigeria, um, being a Londoner. So, um, and I, there's also issues of whether I belong in Britain or not, or whether I belong in Nigeria. I feel a, a particular connection to the Caribbean as well, I think um, partly because of this feeling of slight alienation from both Britain and Nigeria. And the Caribbean is made up of a a population that comes from elsewhere originally, so I feel a, an affiliation to the Caribbean. So my Black Britishness, I guess, is the it's the identity that that I'm most um, um, affiliated with. But there are it's also a blanketing of other aspects of my identity that are important to acknowledge. Do you feel a pressure to prove your Britishness? I mean, does that pressure come from your white peers? I mean, you having to kind of pledge your allegiance to the union, Jack? Do you, do you feel that pressure? I, I don't feel, a, I, I feel a desire to, to have some kind of um, national I identity that I, that I can be fully connected to. And, and, and I have a sense of, um, I feel that I, I should expect to feel that I belong in the UK because I was born there and because I've spent most of my life there. Um, but the fact that my uh, presence there is, has been eternally contested because I'm black, um, that makes me more determined to, to call myself British and to call myself black British. So yeah, it's, it's very important to me. Well, it's complicated in Britain, of course, because Britain's made up of um, several countries. So Britishness and Englishness become complicated terms. So I wrote a piece this summer about the England football team that you might remember did rather well. Um, <laughs> I, actually, I was actually invited to go and speak to the England team a few days before they went to Russia to talk about whether there's a version of Englishness that, is, that makes sense for the country that England has become. So Britishness and Englishness and Welshness and Scottishness are also mixed up in this, this debate about these multiple identities. I mean, the way I feel about it is that so many people I know from, from multiple different backgrounds and complex different backgrounds find themselves navigating around these, these senses of identity and nationalism, national loyalties, which football team do you support, which cricket team do you support. I don't know if you remember, but in the Japan-Korea World Cup, Nigeria played England, which for me was a, was a draw, which was the perfect result. <laughs> because I did feel... I didn't want them to be playing against each other. So I hope next time they play it's a draw, maybe a 5-5 draw, so it looks a bit better, and then Nigeria goes on to win the golden boot. But this is normal. I think this is becoming normal in the 21st century. And also when people talk about you know, mixedness and Britishness or Englishness, within my family there are people who are partly Nigerian but also partly Indian, because not all of my siblings who were Nigerian or half Nigerian, their partners are not always white or Nigerian. 
um, we have Persian members of our family, Welsh as well as English members of our family. So this hybridity, this complicated mixture, I think is becoming the norm. And I think it's going to get to the point in Britain where the majority of people, whether they are ostensibly white or black or brown, when you look at their big family album and the pictures of those big family gatherings, it will be unusual for everyone in those pictures to be of one race. And I think that's the way the demographics say we're going to in, in, in Britain. There's one statistic which I just keep banging on about as a journalist and historian when I write about England, which is one in three children at school age in England at the moment is non-white. They're either mixed or they're black or they're Indian or they're Pakistani or they're Bangladeshi, but one in three. That means in 20 years' time, one in three young adults, one in three voting young, young adults are going to be not white. That's the demographic projection. And I think very few of them, when they're old people, are going to look back at family albums and see a singular monochrome family background. This is the norm, I think. This is the future. But don't you think that that also explains the whole climate of anxiety and paranoia coming from white folks, you know, knowing that they are going to become a minority? How do you see it, Sean? Yeah, it's interesting to me. Um, I think it, it, it does go some way to explaining it, but also you've got to remember that the places in the UK who, um, where they voted most for Brexit Brexit, say, who are most afraid about immigration are also the places where they don't have any immigration. It's the whitest places. It's places like the Isle of Wight, which is actually known for being very white. There's a lot of white people who live there. Um, and so you can't just put it down to like, oh, they're seeing more kids in schools who are brown and, and black. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's fostered by the media. It's fostered by powers outside of our control and outside of our literal vision. Um, so yeah, it, it really saddens me that yeah that, that um, so many people are, are afraid of of us of us um, existing in the country at the moment. Yeah. But you could take you could take solace from the fact that the people who've actually met us yeah, they weren't like the us. people who voted. Yeah. <laughs> it was people who don't know us who voted who have this imaginary tabloid invented version of us of non-white people, African, Indian, Caribbean. They're the people who wanted to leave. They're the people who put a problem yeah. with immigration. So. I mean, I'm, I write about empire, slavery, genocide. I'm not known for being optimistic. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, on people, this you people are. who've read my books don't go, well, he'll be a fun guy. <laughs> Let's get him around for a party. But I think there is a lot of optimism. For the, the, the Brexit vote is a terrible thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I've said it on many panels. I've said it in newspapers. I've said it live on television. It's a disaster. It's one of the few examples of a country deliberately, knowingly damaging itself. It is one of the few biggest own goals in political history. But if you're going to take anything positive from it, it's old people who have old ideas they mm -hmm. learned from a Britain that no longer exists mm -hmm. who voted, and it's people who don't have day-to-day -day contact with people of other backgrounds who voted. Young people predominantly, I think it's 80% yeah. voted to remain. There's a million young people come onto the, vote, onto the voting register since that vote, and a million people who voted leave have died since that vote. Mm -hmm. Brexit was a disaster and is a disaster. It's an ongoing rolling calamity. I just, every day I wake up thinking how we're going to would, escape. But there are positives. Would you guys like another referendum? What do you think? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'd, I'd like one that was governed by the ele electoral commission that wasn't illegal, in which people didn't do things that end, are going to end up with people in court. I'd like a vote that I can believe in. And I'd like people for, who, to be able to vote from 16 given that they're Absolutely. the people most affected. Yeah. But some say um, Brexit was a consequence of the refusal to engage with issues of race, migration, the loss of an empire. Um, what do you think about that? I think Brexit was largely, um, it's a consequence of fear of immigration, which is born from racism and this idea of Britain as this... Uh, homogenous nation. It's, it was, Brexit was all based on lies. I mean, even uh, n not just kind of the lie of race that, because um, race is a construct that we have been forced to live with, but uh, you know, this idea of black people and white people is, is so sort of, um, it, it's so silencing of the particularities and the nuances of people's I identities. And this is a lie and a language that we use all the time, um, which has led to racism and this feeling that immigration is something um, bad and something that's going to break the country. But also the, the Brexit campaign was, was literally 
it was lies. And that's why I just get so annoyed when the government keep banging on about how we're g giving the British people what they wanted and what they voted for because people didn't knowingly vote. People didn't know what they were voting for. We didn't know what it was going to look like. So, so the whole thing is um, sh shambolic and it's, it's a huge lie. And I don't see, I think it would just be, it would be criminal not to give a people's vote. I think for a long time, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but whenever I spoke about racism, being someone of color who grew up in Germany, and when I spoke to black friends, say from the UK or London in particular, they would always say, oh, it's so multicultural, racism doesn't really exist, especially younger ones, you know? And I feel like Brexit was a, like a wake up call for black folks in the UK. Yeah, I think so. I mean one of the things I kept returning to was like the people who who are afraid of um, of immigration. It's us that they see. They don't necessarily see a lot of the Europeans because they look like them. We're the ones who are the visible minorities in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, obviously there were some like, I think there were some horrible letters sent to like the Polish community directly after Brexit and things like that. But um, it was really scary, and I think, it, you know, I mean, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously part of a, a circle of people who are quite, like, woke, so maybe my, um, my experiences are slightly skewed, but in, in my experience being a young person growing up in, in London today, I feel like race issues have never been more spoken about um, than in the, in the past two years, especially, like, sort of since Brexit. Um, all of all of my young friends have had experiences of either overt racism or, or microaggressions. Um, it's 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 definitely something that is on the agenda again, if even if if not before Brexit as well. David, is this? Do you feel like it's a throwback to when you were growing up in the UK, say in the 80s? You know, with the National Front and all of that. Do those memories kind of still linger, or you feel they're being relived again? I think there's a real danger of not acknowledging that we've made enormous strides, that this is not the 80s, that the National Front is not accepted, that comedians aren't on television with racist material, as was tolerated when I was a little boy. I was eight years old when the, when the, the BBC finally cancelled the black and white minstrel show. When I tell our African Americans that we had people in blackface on television until 1979, they do not believe me, because that stuff was stamped out in the 60s in America. It was what well, not in the South, obviously, but in, you know, in the North America, it was stamped out. We're not back there. But what I think we are back is, I think we got too comfortable. To me, there's two events, June 19, 2016, and the referendum is one event. But the event before that is the opening ceremony of the London Olympics in 2012, which was this amazing pageant produced by Danny Boyle, the great director who's doing our new pageant for the end of the First World War centenary, one of Britain's geniuses. And he created this image of a Britain that we want to live in. A Britain in which that celebrated young creativity, that celebrated multiculturalism. And as part of that pageant that reenacted and represented images and moments from Britain's past, there was the Industrial Revolution, there was the creation of the National Health Service in 1948, there was the suffragettes, the First World War, and there was the coming of the SS Windrush, the ship that is the symbolic beginning of post-war black migration from the Caribbean to Britain. And for that to be represented within, alongside these other uncontested moments of obviously, clearly British history that no one would ever question as being British history, that to me was an amazing moment of arrival. And... I think a lot of people, and I wrote about it at the time in newspapers and other people did, a lot of people thought that this was, if not the arrival of the Britain we wanted to live in, at least it was a vision of a possibility of reaching it in our lifetimes. And we were wrong. Because four years later, we woke up and we realized, well, we realized two things. One is that millions of our fellow countrymen and women had watched that Olympic ceremony red in the face with rage because it represented a Britain that they hated. And the other thing, which was pointed out to me by a friend, that was the London Olympics. It wasn't the British Olympics. Mm -hmm. It represented London, and it was an accurate reflection of where London had got to. But London's 8 million people and the UK's 65 million people, and we got it wrong. And we're paying the price in some ways. How does one navigate post-Brexit as a black Breton now with this reality? 
There's, um, well, I definitely feel um, an increased tension as a black British person. I'm much more aware of my blackness and of my race. And I'm, I'm very aware of the statistics. You know, there's been a 40% increase in racist incidents since the Brexit vote, um, especially against Muslims. And, um, you know, but I also live in London, which is it's a city that's around 55% non-white British. And so I, I feel I have, you know, I have a right and an agency to feel at home in my city. But, but that is... Um, you know that there's no uh, there's no rest you know and there's no sort of you're constantly questioning yourself uh, which is why it's so good to be in Nigeria because as soon as i touch down in lagos i always feel this this absence of questioning this inner racial questioning it just completely evaporates you know and it's and that is a wonderful feeling and and it's a luxury of being that, that we just don't have now, and increasingly now in, in the post-Brexit age. How do you convince the rest of Britain to believe in that dream, that multicultural reality that you're living in, say, London? To be honest, I don't think we have to. I think we have to wait for them to die out. <laughs> um, That's gonna take a while. Well, it's happening, I mean, the, the age of people, if you look at the, the people who voted Brexit and look at the age demographics, it's, I mean, they're, they're gone in 30 years. And that sounds really horrible, but it's, it's, and you know, I have a, a huge amount of sympathy for them because they were brought up in a Britain in which they were fed lies. They were fed lies about Britain's empire, its position in the world, its relative wealth. What's frightening about Brexit is not so much that people believed a very seductive, beautifully presented lie that was using the most sophisticated algorithms in the world with a company that's now been forced into liquidation because of its illegal activities that tried to get involved in the election here in this country. It's not just that it was sophisticated, an immense lie presented to them, but it was built on, on previous lies about what the British Empire was. Mm -hmm. It was built on deep, underlying inabilities to confront where Britain ever was in the world, what its true position was, and what its true position is now. Last weekend, there was a huge march in London. We think about 700,000 people turned out to demand a second vote. There was a counter-march in Yorkshire of people saying, don't betray the vote. Don't betray a vote that was elicited on light. But there was a piece of a clip um, shown in the news of a guy, a white British guy, probably in his 60s, and he said, this is all about becoming the British Empire again. That's what it's about. This is terrifying. It's that people honestly believe that this is a possible and realistic venture, that Britain can regain its colonial influence in the world. British Army is 81,000, 25,000 reserves. The Indian Army is 1.2 million with 500,000 reserves. The Chinese Army is 2 million with 1 million reserves. Try sending gunboats up the Yangtze to make them buy opium if you want. <laughs> if you think you can replay what happened in the 1840s and the 1860s, give it a go and see what happens. This is delusional. One of the phrases the Brexiteers, the pro-Brexit campaigners use to describe the Britain that they want to create is buccaneering. We've got to go out in the world and be buccaneering. Buccaneers were pirates. This delusion that you can recreate an empire, this delusion that the former colonies want you back is insane. I wrote a piece in The Observer and I said that Britain is, Britain's ended up looking like a, someone, a guy who's just got divorced on Facebook looking up his ex-girlfriends. Yeah. You know, they don't want us back. We, we, we talk about Empire 2.0. There's this phrase that we're going to create Empire 2.0. No one wants to be part of Empire 1.0. There is this delusion amongst hundreds of thousands, I fear millions of our countrymen, that Britain has the power and the influence to regain what it was in the 19th century or what they think it was in the 19th century, and that the poor, naive, brown and black peoples of the world want, them, want their parents back, want their colonial masters back. It's a patronizing delusion. It, Britain, Britain is a better country than that, and it shows they have never learned anything about what the empire was, that they've, they even give a second to this fantasy. It's terrifying. But playing the devil's advocates here, the reality in Europe is that populist far-right movements 
are being voted into power. They're influencing legislation. So you can't wait for, say, the generation to just die out. I mean, there is a movement across board, even in the United States. So there seems xenophobia is real. I mean, and it's, and, and it's, and not, no, it's not generational. I don't mean to be flippant about it. It's, you know, it's absolutely happening. I, I think the rise of populism and the, and the, the Brexit thing aren't the same thing. I think a lot of people voted Brexit for all sorts of reasons, and let's not get into the most of reasons. But xenophobia, the, the rise of populism, the idea that the rise of populism and the rise of xenophobia are the same thing. The rise of populism is a campaign, and it is using the most sophisticated algorithms we have ever known that have the potential to short-circuit the democratic process. We began this decade, which comes to an end last year, with the, with the the Arab Spring. I remember my father in this city saying how wonderful the Arab Spring was, how this new technology was going to empower these kids to bring back down Mubarak. We end this decade with people asking if these technologies, these algorithms and these social media platforms are inimical to democracy. That's 10 years from Facebook being the thing that's going to bring down dictators to Facebook the thing that's created Trump. Charlie, you want to add anything to that? <laughs> So I'm a bit pissed off about this, as you can hey, tell. I see you're, you're very passionate about it. Let's um, look at the um, Black Lives Matter UK. Um, Charlie, do you think by challenging police brutality, institutionalized racism, that Black Lives Matter UK has been able to achieve something, if at all? Uh, difficult question. I mean, I think the, we saw the height of Black Lives Matter UK in probably t the summer of 2016. Um, they got the sort of the last action that I've, I've known them to do was sort of surrounding environmental is issues in the global south. Um, and they got a bit of backlash to that because I think people failed to understand why that was relevant for black people to be campaigning about. Obviously, it's very relevant. Like, you know, we should all care about the environment and the impact it has on people of color worldwide. Um, since then, I haven't seen a huge amount from them. I think there have been other campaigns by black people in the UK. I think we do care about um, issues to do with police brutality. Um, there is there's a case I can't remember the name of the man who was injured. I don't know if either of you remember that's going that's going through the courts at the moment. Um, and basically, these police officers dra dragged out a young black man um, from a club or didn't allow him into a club, um, and they paralysed him. He's now um, in a sort of vegetative state, um, and there's been a lot of sort of like upset around that in the UK that's happening at, like at this moment. Um, so whether or not whether or not Black Lives Matter UK have challenged institutional institutional racism, I don't know. Whether or not Black people generally in the UK are doing so, I think we are. Um, but it's a it's a slow it's a slow movement. Um, yeah. But, but what I keep asking myself as an outsider, someone observing, I keep noticing that the um, Black British community seems to always wait for cues from the United States, you know, and then they jump on it, even when it comes to names and the branding of a movement, you know. And, and it's always been very problematic because when you see, like, um, when it's about sustaining movements, then when you look at the history of black movements in the United um, Kingdom, like the Black Panther Party or other organizations, and you see how they just fizzle out over two, three, four year periods, you know. We obviously know why. But, but doesn't that also reflect on some kind of inferiority complex? Would, I don't know for lack of a better word. I mean, there is less of us literally in yeah. numbers as well. Like we only make up, I think the last census was 3% of the population in the US. I think it's something like 17%, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're fighting a losing battle in that case also we have like massive concentrations in big cities like London and Birmingham. Um, there is a lot of campaigning going on by, by young black people and older black people in those cities. Um, whether or not they get the press or the national attention as the Black Lives Matter US, debatable. But I do think people are out there doing the work. Like I don't think that we, we can really challenge. Um, yeah, I don't think we can like, we should shit on ourselves in that sense. Sorry, pardon my language. But why are we not, um, why are black Brits not able to sustain movements over a longer period of time, say 20, 30, 40 years, political organizations? What are, what are, what are the challenges when people organize themselves? 
Well, I mean, that, I think there's always, there's always um, political activism going on in black communities in, in Britain. I mean, there, there always has, especially since the 50s and 60s and the, the mass settlement of Caribbean communities. But, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, there's constantly issues with funding and, you know, as, as Charlie was saying, the black presence in Britain is much smaller than in the US. So there isn't as much press, obviously. And, but the, I think there's always work going on. There's lots of work going on in the arts, always has been. Uh, in, in dance and visual arts and literature, especially now, I think there's a new active activism happening on the back of um, on the back of Brexit. So I don't think it's that political organisations don't sustain themselves. I think they do, they do, but they, there's a there's a struggle, and that's an ongoing struggle. Um, when we talk about racism, we tend to forget the impact it has on the mental health of Black people. Um, how are black people affected in the United Kingdom? Well, I mean, we know, we know terribly. Uh, I mean, when I give talks about black British history to young black people, I now beg them. I try to incite them to look after themselves, to take a break from things that they're fighting against. But I think what this comes down to much more often than abuse on the streets, which is has increased by 40%, we know, since 2016, but it's still comparatively rare compared to many other countries in Europe. The problem is institutional structural racism. It's the fact that there was a report last week by the Royal Historical Society that had quantitative as well as anecdotal research from 737 um, non-white academics in Britain studying in the field of history where, where I work. Um, and time and again, what they reported is that when they try to explain to their colleagues how certain actions, behaviors, presumptions, predilections make them feel, how their views are rejected, and they begin to doubt their own sanity. I think this is what's corrosive. I think this is one of the reasons why Rennie um, Edo Lodge's book, uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, I think that's why, why that book's become so important, because mm -hmm. people go to that book to try to remind themselves that they're not crazy. And if everyone around you says your lived experience is in your mind, that's not the recipe for mental health. So I think that, in my experience, and I've, you know, it's the end of Black History Month, I've done about 30 talks, talked to people after the talks, that's their experience, is trying literally to stay sane in a world that says the things that are happening to you aren't really happening. The things that you care about, you shouldn't care about. The bad things eventualities in your life that seem out of your reach, the unfairness that is palpable and visible to you, it's all in your mind. That is, we shouldn't be surprised by the statistics for black mental, health, mental ill health in that environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. <laughs> so, I, I mean, mental health has always been that taboo topic amongst black folks. And, and seeing, I mean, you write pieces, you all do, and your characters as well. Um, it, do you feel like there's that urge to like engage it more? You feel more comfortable talking about it now as a writer, I, as a black writer? I mean, my mental health and um, different conditions um, of uh, bad mental health, that's one of the central themes. That's one of my main interests. In, in my writing is, um, you know, the personal struggles that, that people go through um, and what is the assemblage of material that has created those struggles. And, and it's, it's to do with family and it's to do with society and race is a very important part of that as well. I'm really interested in the way that our history, black history, lays on the black mind, how it impacts on, on the black mind, sort of how we, how we wear that history. That, this is why David's work is so important, because it dissects and breaks down that history. And because and, um, we need to know the things that have happened, and our children need to know what has happened as well. And I think my job as a novelist is to really observe um, how that history impacts on my characters' lives in, in a very sort of detailed and intimate way. So 
in my, in my current novel, there's lots of moments where characters are negotiating the society around them, whether somebody's just walking into a, into a, a club or a function, knowing that they're going to be the only black person in the room and, and how that feels. And also a, a man and a woman in a room and sort of undressing for bed and the woman observing the man and what she sees. She doesn't see a black man. She sees um, so many other things. And this is, what I'm, this is what I mean about that blanketing effect that race has. It's kind of taken away our sense of individuality um, as observed from the outside. And that is so important to give back to black people. So, yeah, mental health is at the forefront of my writing. Can I just say something about writing? Because, I mean, I, I, I make television programs, I write books, um, I work in newspapers, and I sit on various boards. The people who I think are going to cut through, I think, are people like Diane. I think it's novelists. I don't believe, and I think if you look at almost any political movement, there was very often a work of fiction or multiple works of fiction that were critical, that were the thing that reached people. Because I think... There's certain people who are never, ever going to read history books about race. There's certain people who are always going to go into a defensive space. The novel and other, other works of imaginative, uh, creative art can, can achieve, I think, something which no work of journalism or history can achieve. I think people like Dan are just critically important. Because what we're asking people to do is recognize mutual humanity. Mm. And that is... If you were going to come up with a sentence of what art enables us to do, it would be something close to that. So I, 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 and I think when we look at African America, it's not just that there's 40 million of them, not just that 40 million in the richest country in the world, and they have this huge infrastructure, they have 200 years of building universities and institutions. It's also that they have this incredible body of literature. Yeah. And we need more events like this. We need more black British novelists. We need more novelists from the diaspora who aren't in Britain to come to Britain and relate to what's going on there around race. Because it's novelists, it's not people like myself who can affect change inside people's hearts. I could batter on, bang on in the news and have arguments and shout at people on television. But actually changing people's minds is what we're talking about. And that's what creative art is. Charlie, I was reading a piece you wrote uh, where you talked about the British criminal justice system and how it affects black people and people of color. Um, I mean, considering the fact that, as you said, you, we, you make up 3% of the population, yet 10% of the prison inmates are black. That is a problem, isn't it? So how can people trust, have any trust whatsoever in the judicial system? I think if you're black, you shouldn't trust it. It's as simple as that, yeah. Um, you, um, it, it, in the piece I think you're referring to, um, I was sort of looking specifically at black women's experiences in, in the judicial system. Um, and it was quite hard to find women who are willing to talk to me about it. Um, I don't, obviously it's not something that you want to sort of um, speak publicly on a lot of the time. But the women that I did speak to, they had all sorts of experiences, whether that's have, being in front of a judge who is, who is just racist, but like very clearly racist. Um, racism from, um, from uh, prison guards, um, struggles when they get out of prison to sort of assimilate back into life with n little to no support system. The fact that, especially as women, if you look at the statistics, um, a lot of black women tend to be the sole carers of, um, of children. Um, so when they go to prison, what happens to their children? Um, it's, it's, it's really a system that works against black women and black people just more generally in the UK. Um, and I think that the Lamy Review, which was uh, commissioned by uh, one of the, the good Labour politicians at the moment, um, it should have got more, more press, in, in my opinion. Um, it didn't? It did, but not as much as it should have. I don't think that most people are, are aware of the fact that, much like in America, we have our own issues in terms of black people being criminalized. And then it relates back to the, what we're seeing with the Windrush scandal now. I don't know how, how many of you know about the Windrush scandal, but basically people from the Caribbean who were British citizens ended up being deported because of um, government failures. But um, a lot of them had, had criminal um, hi histories. Um, 
and they're now not even even after the scandal has broken they're not being allowed back into the country but then you have to wonder why there is more black people who are in jail who have been criminalized so it's all it's all it's all connected in my opinion and really really sad um yeah i think if you looked at the last century of british criminal history the conclusion you'd have to come to is that reports investigations recommendations inquiries only have any purchase if there's been a riot or a black person's been killed. And that's the horrible reality. If you think about the ones where they affected change, there had been violence or there had been deaths. So it's a really bleak thing to say, but I think if you look at the path, you'd have to come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah, that, I was going to tie into that because, I mean, as a historian, you're very familiar with the dynamics, so it comes as no surprise. I remember reading in your book where how Britain dealt with the black poor and deported them to Sierra Leone, you know, and formed a colony there. So, so the, for you as an historian, being able to contextualize that and also share this information, I think it's very vital. It is, but I, I mean, I think, I think black history is really important, but I think what's critical is we understand it's a shared history, that it's a history that is not only of and for black people, it's a British history. And it's been marginalized, and in some ways we've played along with it being marginalized. We've seen this black British history as a thing only for us to do the really important thing of refuting the thing that Hegel and other people said, which is black people have no history, that they have no deeds, no title deeds for being Britain. Now, the history can disprove that very easily. You can give me 10 minutes and I can disprove the idea that black people only turned up in Britain, Britain recently. I can point to all sorts of information, but I think more... more more deeply than that, it's about a shared history. It's about the fact that this country, so Britain, has been embedded in the relationship with Africa for half a millennium. And Africans and, Af and the people of Africa have been part of Britain's story, Britain's fortune, Britain's empire, Britain's view of the world, and Britain's lived experience of people in Britain and in British colonies for half a millennia. So this story, you, you, can't, you can't marginalize it. Time and again, the fate of Africans, the humanity of Africans, the future of Africa were the biggest issues of the day. In the 17th, late 18th century, the issue about slavery and abolition was the biggest story of the day. In the, in the last 30 years of the 19th century, the scramble of Africa was one of the biggest issues of the day. In the 1950s, 1960s, when this country was breaking away from Britain, the end of empire, decolonization, was the biggest story of the day. This, you, even if you didn't care about black people, you didn't want to hear their stories. If you're going to confront the reality of British history, you just have to encounter black people because we are part of the British story. So I think that history needs to do two things. It needs to show Hegel he was wrong, and we do have a history. We always had a history, and it doesn't begin when the Portuguese arrive in Ghana. But also that the British have a history, and it's a joint history with us, and it's our history, good and bad, and we have to deal with it together. So I think it needs to do both those things. So we'd like to open the floor for questions, comments. Um, do we have a mic to go around? Please make your questions brief and no long statements, please. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, my question goes to um, mostly to David Olushoga, partly because you're a historian, and I've been enjoying your your histories. And I wish you'd been around when I was a child in Britain, who could um, refute the argument of why South apartheid South Africa should be supported because they stood with us, whereas what did the black people do? It was a very prevalent um, story. But speaking as somebody, I must confess that now my British passport is really a means of travel rather than an identifier. Um, and looking on the Brexit disaster from afar in complete bewilderment and, and bafflement, I was struck by the hostility that has been shown whenever a historical, something of Roman Britain or medieval England or anything that is shown and a black person appears, then the, um, 
the comments come from outraged of um, tooting wherever, saying that, um, that this is political correctness gone mad, that there were no black people in Roman Britain and so on, or medieval and so on and so forth. And I sort of, um, I mean, I tried to draw a parallel between the fact that there are black people in Britain now because Britain had an empire. So it would be natural for black people to be in Roman Britain because <laughs> Romans too had an empire. But I feel that um, there's an attempt in some way to erase the previous history of black people and present them as having just arrived and therefore as something that can be easily reversed. And I wonder what you and the other members of the panel feel about the idea that it, it's a bit like the Arabs and the Israelis, that we can get rid of them quickly. It's just 50 years or just... 20 years old, they, they will soon be gone. There's somewhere that they can still go back to. I, I think that's a very accurate characterization of what's happening. The moment this history is put forward, it is deemed to be put forward polit for political reasons. And as an historian, I'm accused of someone who's involved of a, in a professional neglect of duty, but I'm trying to tell a political story rather than an historical story. And there's a couple of things which are interesting about that. Is first of all, people will say that you're doing this to, uh, to pretend that you belong in Britain. I, I'm not interested in this history because I'm questioning my right to be in Britain. I've got a passport, I pay my taxes, I've got every damn right to be in the country because I'm British. I'm also Nigerian. So this is not coming from a position of weakness, which is a presumption and a very interesting presumption. But the big question it raises is why are there so many millions of my fellow countrymen and countrywomen in Britain who are threatened by the idea that there was a black Roman, threatened by the idea that the trumpeter to Henry VII and Henry VIII was an African, disturbed by the idea that the goddaughter of Queen Victoria came from, uh, from West Africa. Why does that reality, that demonstrable reality, bother them so much? And why are they so willing to attack anybody, even eminent classical scholars like Professor Mary Beard, who portray these things as facts. This is about the refusal of facts. And in that respect, it's part of a bigger issue. that We are facing a political battle in which people believe in fantasy so strongly that they will attack facts and th figures of authority who, in other respects and in, on other issues, they wouldn't dream of questioning. When Professor Mary Beard, one of this country's one of the world's greatest classicists, is attacked by thousands and thousands of people for pointing out the reality that, as you say, unsurprisingly, a multi-intercontinental, multi-racial empire, like, that is surprising, never mind challenging. When these sort of things happen and people like Mary Beard are dragged into it, this is not just about racism, this is about a fantasy. There are a lot of people who need to believe that we arrived yesterday and therefore somehow can be isolated, dissected, and removed. And that's terrifying. And they're out there. I think it's also interesting because I've been working on this book about, about Windrush and, um, and I really made the point to, to sort of... Sorry, um, oh, sorry. Um, I really made the point to, um, to, to highlight the fact that Windrush should be used as a marker to look backwards and look forwards rather than being like, oh, this is the first black people in the country because obviously I've read your work and I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's correct. But... Um, it's it's uh it's really a, a widespread idea like that permeates not not just I would say like white white British culture, culture but within um, black British culture as well that that Windrush is this like signifier of like blackness um, and if that has been twisted and and used in a way to say that oh we can just get rid of them like they came here and it was our choice then then that's really sad um, I think yeah. Um, yeah, I think of, I keep thinking of James Baldwin at, at this moment, his question about, um, which is crucial here, what is it about whiteness, what is it about the white psyche that, that requires um, to think, requires the idea of blackness as something that's inferior to whiteness, and what is that about, and um, where did that come from? And until that question is answered, until there is this deep psychological analysis within the white psyche, um, the, the race question and the problem is never going to be solved because that's where it essentially comes from, from this deep insecurity and needing to feel a sense of superiority over another group of people. Why is that? Where does it come from?
I see Lola is saying no more questions. Uh, can we take one? Or can I strong arm you? Or... Very quick, no comment, question, or if you comment, we stop you. I, I saw her. I came from very far. I've been seeing. <laughs> Ladies first. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> hello, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for um, the discussion so far. David, I read your book. I'm, well, I'm outstanding the last chapter. But what was so interesting for me growing up in Nigeria and going to school in the UK is this rich history and how a series of historical events have brought us to where we are. So from where you spoke about Henry VIII, because he left the Catholic Church and was able to, whether roguely, start to um, trade along the coast of West Africa to where we find ourselves today. What's interesting is that you sit on the panel now as Nigerian British or Black British, where you have a constant, very conscious tension that exists with your cultures or your backgrounds to where you live in the West. Whereas in this environment, we have a very stealth understanding of our history. Very rarely in this environment do we acknowledge the influence of slavery, imperialism, colonialism in our everyday lives. When you look at the relationship that we on this side of the pond have with this history, what do you really see? Because I personally see it, an ignorance that's very disturbing. From your average Nigerian, we're not aware of who we are or how we've come to be where we are today. And it's upsetting. We don't even have history taught in schools anymore. It's, it's very disturbing. And, and I would love to hear your views on that. I think when you look at the work being done on Africa before colonization, well, contact is a better word. And if you look at the work being done on the resistance in this continent to slavery, the majority of the scholars are either African Americans or they're Africans in American universities. If we didn't have African scholars in American and very small extent British universities doing this work, I don't think it would be being done. I think there's a fear of this history, like there's a fear of British history, because in some of this, we don't look very good. I think we need to confront the complicity of African rulers in the centuries of the slave trade. I think we need to um, confront how they were involved in wars against those who were resisting the slave trade. This is a history of African resistance, but it's also a history of African complicity, and it's not being well explored in Africa. There are some enormous exceptions and some brilliant scholars working on it, but it, I, it's... it's I can't stand there and tell British people, you need to confront the dark sides of your history for one half of who I am and not say that I have a similar desire to say the same thing to my father's family and my father's country here in Nigeria, because I do. Well, very strong words. Um, I want to thank all three of you for bringing the conversation back home. It's very, very important for shedding light into a very complex topic and also reminding us of our complicity and also the denial within as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, David. Thanks, Anne. And we look forward to more conversations outside and within the building. <laughs> Thank you very much. A big round of applause for this amazing panel. Thank you. So don't forget... They're going straight away. You guys are awesome. Thank you. I just like the way you are clapping for them. Okay. So they are now going to go and sign their books. So again, they're going to the signing area. So if you want to purchase uh, Black and British or Motherland or Ordinary People, don't forget Diana still has a book chat later. So there'll be another opportunity. Um, you can go to uh, the signing area right away. I think I already said that. Okay. So, we have a book chat here next. It will be starting in two minutes. If you want to buy the book, just go now. Go now. They're taking them there. Just go. Eh? They're selling. Just go out there and turn left. Oh, brilliant. Well, just go there to get it signed. So, if you've bought it already from somewhere else, we won't hold it against you. We'll still let you sign it here. We'll take it out of you later. <laughs>